Today on LA Currents, Los Angeles was officially incorporated as a city in April 1850. It's one of the oldest cities in North America, and it's a city where every corner has a story. Next, this former member of the California State Assembly and the LA City Council consistently works to reform and defend LA. But first, he's been one of LA's most prominent and powerful political figures for nearly 30 years. We catch up with Council Member Mark Ridley Thomas about his district and the changes that are up and coming. Hello and welcome to LA Currents, I'm Anita Bennett. There are many changes underway in Council District 10 and the man who represents that area, City Councilman Mark Ridley Thomas, is with us today to discuss some of the important issues making headlines. Thank you so much for being here. Delighted to be here. All right, let's get started. Let's talk okay. about COVID. You spearheaded the ordinance that just passed in the city council, mandating that city employees get vaccinated. Why now and why did you help lead that effort? Well, Anita, it's very, very clear that the Delta variant is pressing its way in a manner that we cannot take for granted. Public employees are to serve the public, not put the public at risk, whether you're a firefighter or a police officer or a librarian, whatever the case may be, uh, whether you work in the parks, uh, you have to be healthy, nothing unusual about that. You can't be a spreader. Um, there's an obligation there, and at the same time, you have an obligation to your co-workers not to make them sick. Um, and so as employers, uh, as those who understand what public service means, uh, we needed to do what was necessary in the interest of public health. Public service is designed to complement public health and not compromise public health. I definitely understand the reasoning, but there are some people who say this is a violation of their, their civil rights, their personal rights. So how do you respond to that? There are points in which uh, the claim about rights from a privacy point of view, from a civil libertarian point of view, um, collide with the rights that a community ought to enjoy in terms of standards of public health. Um, and I believe it's a misplaced debate to force the issue in that matter. I want to be safe, I want to be healthy, and I want to enjoy the full range of rights that ought to be accorded to us as those who reside in Los Angeles, those of us who reside in California, those of us who reside in the United States of America. We can do both, but we cannot allow anyone for reasons that can't be substantiated to square with health and well-being to compromise the health and well-being of others. Let's talk a little bit about homelessness. You did vote um, for the restrictions on sidewalk encampments. Why, why did you cast that vote? My objective in advancing uh, a perspective that says that there has to be accountability for the uptick in homelessness in the city of Los Angeles. And I think a couple of things have, have to happen. We need to address this crisis from the vantage point of care, from the vantage point of compassion, and from the vantage point of compliance, all three care, compassion, and compliance. Um, and the enforcement perspective has often meant mostly compliance, but that doesn't get the job done. The only thing it does is potentially incarcerate people, which we know doesn't work, and it moves them around from one corner to the next and all of that, that doesn't get it done. The residents of the city of Los Angeles expect us to do much better than we have done. And therefore we need to have policies ensconced in the right to housing. We need to have a, a right to housing strategy that is operationalized, that deals with prevention, 
interim housing, permanent housing, and street engagement. And the street engagement means that before there is any talk of enforcement, we will have exhausted the menu of things that needs to be done uh, to get people off the streets into suitable housing. Nothing else will work. And my vote was designed to set that scenario up and in a matter of weeks, you'll see um, the adoption, I believe, of the street engagement strategy yes. where we have nurses, where we have social workers, housing navigators, and the like, not police officers, uh, working with people in ways that this city has not seen. That's what must happen. We have identified those areas that have particularly intense examples of encampments and we will go to work we have already begun to show that this does work and it takes resources it takes the proper personnel it takes a determined and committed community um, uh, but I have to tell you it is simply incorrect to suggest that people do not wish to uh, leave the encampments and those encampments are where they think they belong um, our experiences are just the opposite. When afforded the opportunity to get the kind of attention in the context of a housing um, circumstance, and it's a range of housings, mm -hmm. it's not one, vouchers, uh, motel conversions, um, name them, the bridge home, a lot of options out there, not just one. Mm -hmm. We don't do one size fits all. And so to the extent that that's the case, we see that they will move at the Mert Park. Most I said, of them, because I have interviewed a few yeah. who said they absolutely did not want to be sheltered. Right. The work has to continue to take place uh, because, as you mentioned, not only is it the case that some said, no, I don't want to leave. Yeah. We've run into that. But once they do leave and go into uh, a housing situation, they leave the housing situation and return to uh, the area of the encampment only to find that it's no longer there in one instance and they repopulate. Our job is to say no, 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 no. That's not what we are prepared to uh, accommodate. What is it we can do to cause you to be committed to stay in a housing situation that you can get better? Once we have exhausted the opportunities for them to be afforded housing, uh, then they have to come to appreciate that they are not to be afforded an opportunity uh, to drive down the quality of life of a particular neighborhood or resident. Can't do that. And I think when that message is delivered by the proper entities, in many instances, that's the nonprofit, that's that nurse, that's that uh, social worker, that's the person with lived experience, the housing navigator. They get the message, but it's not after one interaction. It's not like you show up or else. No, this is trust building. This is trying to meet them where they are. This is seen through a trauma-informed lens. The very things that police officers are not obliged to do because they're not trained to do. What are some of the positive things that are really going on in CD10 that constituents can get excited about? Well, we have a lot of uh, wonderful activities going on. I mentioned Lemert Park because Lemert Park is about to see the opening of the new Vision Theater. Lemert Park has already uh, seen the uh, restoration of the plaza uh, park there. Uh, the merchants are coming back up from under the weight of the uh, pandemic. Uh, we'll see uh, street beautification and a whole range of things. Uh, the vendors are having themselves a good time and so it's a lot going on there and uh, there's a little library that's been closed for 21 years um, uh, at the, it's the Irvin Branch Library um, on Arlington just north of Washington 21 years closed a library I believe wow. literacy is fundamentally important to the civic health 
uh, of a community. Um, and so we're working very forcefully to make sure the library sees a new day. Vibrant, complex, and beautiful. That is LA. Happy 240th birthday, Los Angeles. We hear from community members who celebrate this milestone and retrace LA's colorful history. Well, pre-pandemic, the celebration for the city's birthday was quite a large event. Uh, we would have uh, dancers kicking it off, music and entertainment, reenactment and recreation, and then uh, we'd have a birthday celebration here, with, including a birthday cake. So um, it was a, a quite a, a, an event to attend. Obviously this has changed due to the pandemic and uh, this year we're doing mostly most events uh, virtually. This is not the first quarantine in Los Angeles' history. When the Pobladores first arrived at the San Gabriel Mission, they were suspected of having smallpox and were quarantined a few leagues from the mission. Later on, they journeyed to found the city of Los Angeles. On September 8th, we will celebrate the 250th anniversary of the, of the founding of San Gabriel Mission. The mission had been here about 10 years before Los Angeles. It was founded by Father Junipero Cerro, and um, it was the, the fourth of the California missions. Um, they, started, they started in the south, and they, 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 moved, they moved northward. As far as its relationship to the city of Los Angeles, there, there, there were many immigrants who came up, they found refuge here at the mission, and then a group of 44 of them, 10 years later, moved, moved uh, west to what is, what is now Los Angeles, to found another parish, which they called Our Lady of the Angels, which is still there, and, um, and, and, and it's there that the city of Los Angeles was founded. The city was founded by a mixed group from Mexico, Spain, and Africa. There were 44 settlers of mixed ancestry, so uh, they were close to Mission San Gabriel and got leadership from them. So from this very spot is where the, the pilgrims walked to go to Go, go, go to Los Angeles. And that was the beginning of Los Angeles. Since then, we have partnered with the Mission San Gabriel, El Pueblo, and the city of Los Angeles to hold a walk from San Gabriel to Los Angeles to celebrate the founding of our region. While we're not able to hold in-person celebration this year, we would still like to recognize the journey that cements the sheer history between the city of San Gabriel and the city of Los Angeles. This is very meaningful to both cities and we'd like to keep that tradition going. We would partner with the uh, Mission San Gabriel where the original Pueblo Dores came in to the Pueblo Historic Monument uh, to establish the city. And we recreate the walk, a nine mile walk down to, uh, from uh, Mission San Gabriel to the city of Los Angeles. They have people walking from San Gabriel Mission to the plaza, and that's rather exciting to have people do that like the early settlers did.
<laughs> and we can uh, just walk the trail and just say, hey, this is what happened 240 years ago. This is St. Gabriel uh, mission and the walk to uh, downtown LA, El Pueblo, is part of a national trail. We're part of the history. Uh, and uh, so that's why we celebrate every year. I came to work there in 1977, and in 1984, it stopped being a state historic park and became a city monument. And that's different only in the sense that it now belongs to the city. It's the city's birthplace and or celebrated as such. And that's, I think, very important. But as we all know, our ancestors lived in what today is Los Angeles. This is our ancestral village. We are the direct lineal descendants of Yagna. Los Angeles was and is home to Yagna, the ancestral village of the San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians. While we celebrate the city of Los Angeles' 240th birthday, we acknowledge that these lands are the ancestral home of the indigenous people of this region. One very important aspect of the Pueblo is the Siqueiros mural, which was painted by David Alfaro Siqueiros. It caused a complete shock that didn't fit in with the happy picture of Los Angeles and the glorious past. And by 1938, the entire mural had been whitewashed, which is a terrible thing to do to a work of art. And when I started to work at El Pueblo, we decided that something had to be done about the mural and to save it. And uh, I was lucky enough to get in contact with the Getty Art Museum and people at the Getty, and they have worked very hard to save the mural and to restore it and preserve it. Everybody should learn about their history. It's an important subject. July 11th, 2020, I got the call at, at five o'clock in the morning that the church was on fire. Um, and um, the roof, the, almost the, com the complete roof was destroyed. Um, much of the interior of the church was destroyed. Miraculously, the fire stopped at the altar. So lots of damage, lots of damage. I think our, bi our biggest victory so far is that the permanent roof was just completed two weeks ago. So we hope to be back in the Mission Church and um, ready for worship probably in July of 2022. For many people, this has been their spiritual home for many, many years. Um, in fact, um, there are families that have been here for generations. It is also a pilgrim site. There are many people who try to visit all of the California visions, and, and to this day, people are coming and didn't even know there was a fire and are kind of disappointed that they can't get in. But, um, but it is, so it is a broken church, but it, it is also a, obviously a historic landmark, and, and it's also a place of pilgrimage. And actually, it's not just a religious center, but also a culture center. So uh, they have a museum there, and it preserved for over 250 years. So this is uh, one of the precious, uh, precious place in the city of St. Gabriel. We have been here for 250 years, and that's what we will celebrate on September 8th. Since you are doing this program to celebrate the city's birthday, I'd like to say, happy birthday, Los Angeles.
on behalf of everyone in San Gabriel, happy birthday, Los Angeles. Happy birthday, Los Angeles. Happy birthday, Los Angeles. Happy birthday, Los Angeles. Next, we chat with city attorney Mike Fuhrer about his implementing vaccine mandates and how he made public safety a priority with the Neighborhood Justice Program. Well, he's been LA's chief lawyer and prosecutor since July of 2013. I am delighted to be joined today by LA City Attorney Mike Fuhrer. You've been extremely vocal recently about vaccine right. mandates. And there are a lot of things in the air when it comes to vaccine mandates. So how would that work? So let's identify a couple different categories of mandate. First, the city council just approved a vaccine mandate for city employees. And I think that's really important, especially employees are coming in contact with the public all the time. And if in fact a person who is capable, able, and physically um, unwilling to get a vaccine, do they lose employment when it comes to these? That remains to be seen in the city. I think there are options that the city can take. The city could say that, the city could provide some suspension without pay, the city could do any of a number of things that has yet to be determined. Um, when it comes to the mandate that I've called for in those public spaces, restaurants, bars, gyms, those kinds of locations, uh, the consequence is you don't get in. Is there a precedent for this kind of action? Not that I can recall. Okay. I mean, this is, but we live in a time that is utterly unprecedented. Got it. You know, the Spanish flu in 1918 provided us with some template for how this kind of a pandemic can spread. But by and large, everything that's happening now with regard to the pandemic is something we are learning as we go through it. And we're learning lessons from this. And one of those lessons is, at this point, getting the vaccine is imperative and it's safe. And for anybody who is watching who is skeptical of that, I will just say FDA just gave approval formally in the same way it's approved all the other vaccines that you and your family take in order for your kids to go to school, for example. This is now in that very same category, get it done. The pandemic created a lot of opportunities for scam artists, and you've right. been fighting very diligently right. about that as well. So what are some of the things that people should be cognizant of, aware of, and protect themselves from? When there were those who attempted to price gouge, to charge excessive amounts for necessities, we worked closely with Amazon, for example, to help us identify who online was involved in trying to charge excessive amounts to the public. We went after them. The public should know that we are investigating other facets of how the pandemic touches their lives, that intersection of consumer protection and public health. And it may be that in the next couple of weeks we emerge with some new information and perhaps a new case or two that will matter a lot. This is probably the time in the life of the city that's been the most challenging since I can remember. Really? Because there are so many crises that are converging at this, and that the convergence of those issues makes it all the more important that each of us steps way beyond what we're used to doing to try to solve these things. We have everything from the pandemic to uh, homelessness to urgent calls for racial justice and police reform, crime is it. However, especially gun violence is escalating in South Los Angeles. We have all these issues at once and uh, that calls on us to lead. You've been very also vocal about um, the eviction moratorium. It's not the fault of the tenant or the landlord that the pandemic has so devastated the economy that the tenant has lost her job and she can't afford to pay the landlord. And at the inception of this, I reached out, including to a member of Congress, to say it's essential that there be some federal aid here because unlike the city government, which must balance its budget, and the state government, which must do the same, the federal government can borrow money in a crisis. And this is a real crisis. Right. And in the middle of the pandemic, when that dynamic's in play, we also have the potential for many of these tenants to lose their apartments. In Los Angeles, we have 41,000 people who are homeless on the streets of our city, 30,000 of whom have no place to live on a given night. So to face the possibility of those numbers escalating dramatically in combination with all the other emergencies we're facing right now was, was a bridge too far. At this moment, providing some stability to that tenant who otherwise is on the precipice of losing their place to live 
is vital. Your Our Neighborhood Justice Plan, it's working. Oh, it's been fabulous. So, and I want to encourage our viewers to participate with us in this. They can volunteer to join us in this. There's been a lot of discussion about criminal justice reform. Here's what that means to me in this program. It means we're trying to inter interrupt the trajectory of the life of someone who is starting to commit crime and turn their life around. I want to reduce recidivism, which means reducing the likelihood of a repeat offense. So neighborhood justice does a lot of great things at once. We say to someone who's committed a nonviolent offense, um, if you go through neighborhood justice, we won't prosecute you. You won't have a record. Neighborhood justice involves the recruitment of hundreds of volunteers throughout our city. We recruit them and we train them in principles of restorative justice. The person who committed the offense comes into a nonprofit center where we have the sessions occur. Three of those trained volunteers sits with the um, person who committed the offense. It's also a supervisor who oversees the process. And their job is to say, look, we live in the neighborhood where the crime was committed. We're here because we want to improve our neighborhood and we want to help you too and hold you accountable all at once. So the person comes in, they have to take responsibility for what they did. They come in and they explain what happened, why they did what they did, what their life is like. Those panelists prescribe an obligation in the community that that person must perform because the community has been diminished by that crime, not just a single victim. So it might be tutoring kids or painting out graffiti or lecturing on the dangers of alcohol sales to, to high school students or fixing vandalized property, whatever. So in addition, we try to offer intervention when we can, like job training, for instance. And we know the program works. We've had thousands of people go through it. And the recidivism rate for misdemeanors generally is 30, 40, 50 percent. For our neighbor justice program, 5 percent. Almost no one is recommitting an offense. So we know this is working. And I know from the volunteer standpoint, it's very rewarding. We've had two of our volunteers submit to the LA Times opinion pieces that have run in the paper. And the essence of both pieces is this. In this tumultuous world, volunteers have written, I've been struggling with how I can add value in my community, how I can actually make life better. It's such, those problems are so huge. In neighborhood justice, I found my place. I have found a way to help turn around someone's life and make my neighborhood safer at the same time. So it's a win for everybody. And what is the parameter of this volunteer person? So the volunteers sit in panels of three mm -hmm. and they inquire of the person who committed the offense, you know, so much your life, why'd you do what you do? They ask very pointed questions sometimes. One, I, I watched one session where a theft was involved and one of the volunteers said, you know, I understand your circumstances are very tough, but I don't have much money and I live here and I shop in that store too and I spend more than I should for the items I buy because they have to have a line in their budget for loss because people like you oh. steal from them. I mean, so there's a lesson in that exchange when that very authentic volunteer is describing very sincerely why this matters and the person who committed the offense is taking responsibility for what she did at the same time learning about the impact on others. Um, and I just think that this is the f future direction for a lot of criminal justice. We prosecute a lot of cases where there is a serious punitive component, a, a domestic violence assault, for example, or the sex abuse of kids. We have cases like that that we handle. Sure. But there are other cases involving the theft of a nominal amount of, of, my, of money or goods or other kinds of crimes for which accountability is really important, but where we have a chance to say, let's change your life a little bit so you don't do it again. And, and that's the beauty of this program. And uh, again, for misdemeanor offenses, we've had others around the country seek us out to learn how they can replicate their pro our program in other parts of America. And I think that that's a sign that we're onto something. If people want to get more information? So they can go to our website, lacityattorney.org. They can, on the website, they can find our phone number as well. I'm sure you'll post uh, that phone you number on this. And um, I just want to say, I know that this is a tough time for everybody, but things will get better. If we come together as a team, we can work together to make L.A. better.